wondering what today's lesson will be about. Today's lesson is going to be about emotions. Now we all start with a primary set, and as we grow older, we acquire more of them. When your emotions control your action, it affects not only yourself, but the people around you. This will help to down. Emotions are centered in the lower part of the brain. It is complicated, yes, but mysterious no longer. Emotional behavior is largely involuntary. <laughs> I can't believe that. We have certain basic emotions which are controlled subconsciously. Notice your own emotional reactions. What did you feel? What did you do? Under control, your emotions can make you healthier and happier and improve the lives of people around you. This is pretty clever. That's a rather simplified suggestion of a complex mental process, but you get the idea. Well, welcome everybody. Brewster, good to have you here. Thanks for tuning in. If you're tuning in online now or uh, later in the week, thanks for doing that, and thanks for showing up here in Chelan. Uh, starting a new series about emotions. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the emotion of fear. Um, not, uh, I'm not sure how you feel about it. Uh, all over the internet, whether you're an old person on Facebook or you young kids on um, the dirty TikTok, uh, the, uh, or worse, Snapchat, um, there is uh, all these scare, uh, like prank, prank scare things, you know what I'm saying? Like, have you seen that Bushman guy? Yeah, yeah, he, dread, he, he you think he's a bush and go walking by and he jumps out at you? Um, or, or just, nor, uh, like, co-workers, they seem to be pranking and scaring the same co-worker over and over and over again. You know what I'm saying? Um, I love watching them because you don't know your reaction until your reaction. Like, if I ask you ahead of time, hey, if a guy just like a bush jumped out and scared you, what would you do? You're like, that ah, wouldn't bother me. Well, then you have these grown men just squealing like little uh, 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 girls. Uh, uh, or, or I love the one where it jumps out, and then the guy just starts punching, you know? Like, uh, some, some are scared, some are, like, unfazed, some are, are, are uh, uh, aggressive. But uh, I was thinking, I'm madly in love with my wife. You all know that. Crazy in love with her. But if I ever wanted a divorce, I could get a quick divorce just by scaring her two or three days in a row. She doesn't dig that at all. Like, I learned that in the early days, like am I hiding behind, you know, in the laundry room and she walked in like, ah, that no, doesn't go over very well at our house at all. Uh, she's a puncher. Um, so listen, when it comes to fear and uncertainty, uncertainty or fear doesn't alter our value system. Like when, when you're uncertain about something, uh, but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't change your value system. You know where we saw this? COVID, right? When COVID hit, we all had different reactions to it. So when we look back on COVID times, it's not like, because we we're all over the place, right? Like churches should shut down because the hospitals are full of people. We don't want to contribute to that. Churches should never shut down because no one shuts down the word of God. And Kyle, you should keep meeting as real life. And I'm like, we can't. They kicked us out of the building. We'll meet in your backyard. We'll kick us out of the homo association. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they, and so I have friends, friends that were mad at me that we quit meeting here. And I had friends that were mad at me that we came back too early when we started meeting in the community gym. Remember that? Remember those COVID days? Remember when we preached out of Brett Lamar's garage? Now I look like a POW just standing there. Listen, uncertainty or fear doesn't alter your value system. It exposes it. When we are uncertain, when I am uncertain, when I'm scared, when I don't know what tomorrow is, when, when the, and maybe it's fear, maybe it's anxiety. I'm not sure what the difference is all the time. But when we don't know what's coming, then our true values come out. You may scream, you may punch, you may run, you may be unfazed. I say all the time, when something bad happens to you, it reveals who you are. Like, I mean, I hate this, but who you are before you get a cancer diagnosis 
is who you are after you get a cancer diagnosis. And that's a horrible, difficult time. Who you are before you lose a loved one is who you are after you lose a loved one. So your value system, those things don't alter who you are and what your values are. They just reveal who you, what your values are. And this morning, I want to take the next 30 minutes and just offer a challenge as we move ahead in the next couple days, weeks, months, and four more years. I want to talk a little bit about not who to vote for or which party to sign up for, but I want to offer you a challenge that, listen, I was talking to someone before I started, and I kind of watered it down this morning a little bit because I felt a little harsh as I went over my sermon. I'm not, I don't want to come across as saying, you better do this, you better do this, you better do this, or you're going to hell. Harsh, huh? And I would never say that, but I don't want to even appear that way. Or, you better vote like me, you better vote like me, and you better vote like me, or get out of my church. It's none of that. It's not, it has nothing to do with even politics or who to vote for. The challenge I want to give you is this. The challenge is to put your faith, oh, to put your faith before politics. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you got to pay attention. And not because it's me talking. Jesus is going to talk to you. The New Testament is going to talk to you. All right? If you're not yet a believer, whether sitting here in Brewster or online, man, this is a great Sunday for you to be here. Because you can say to your Christian friends, ha you are a hypocrite. <laughs> You'll know what Jesus calls his followers to look like and act like, and talk like. So whether you're a believer or not, and I would even say if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, when you see Jesus' approach and how he cares and deals with other people, you may want to lean into that a little bit. All right? Listen. It's my goal in the next few minutes to get you to consider that you would put your faith, that your walk with Jesus, that God Almighty is more important than politics than who to vote for, than who's president, than who's governor, who's sent, all that stuff, all right? Because guess what? No one goes to Washington, D.C. when they die. (laughs) Now, you may think, there's some dead people in Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah, they've been there a long time. (laughs) Listen, we're talking about people's souls, eternity, life. And we want to boil it down to just this all about who's going to show up to the Senate and the White House. Here's another thing I know. In my job, and I, 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 it's an honor, I show up in times of discomfort and pain and loss in people's life. Not one time have I been at the hospital or side, the bedside of someone that was dying where, they, where people in pain or in the hospital asked me to read the Constitution to them. They never said, Kyle, would you comfort me with the words of Thomas Jefferson? Not once. Now, as satirical as that is, it's so true. We make such a big deal out of something that's not eternal. Now, before, I'm just going to say this, and then you can't say I didn't say it. You should vote. Everyone should vote. Go vote. You should vote. In Washington, it's easy. You got a mail-in, sit down, watch TV, and vote. You should all vote. Why would you live in a free country that you get to exercise your right to vote and you don't vote? You should vote. Everybody should vote. Now, most of us When I talk about putting your faith before politics, most of us don't have a problem with that because we don't see any conflict between our faith and our politics. In fact, we think it's the same thing. And that's where I get into trouble. The way I believe about Jesus is also equal to what I feel about politics. It's the same thing. I don't think it is. Listen, 
it's not even, I don't think that the right approach now is to say, put the Bible first and politics second. Because on any party, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green Party, whatever, on any party, they can go to Scripture and say, this is what the Bible says about my party and why we believe what we believe. For example, you would say, um, I'm a Republican, right? Because the Bible says that God is righteous, Jesus is righteous, they're right, God's right, Jesus is right, I'm right, I'm a Republican. Look at me. Or if you're a Democrat, you would say, listen, if you look at the life of Jesus, he was a free healthcare dispensing machine. He healed people constantly for free. Everyone should have free health care because Jesus offered it all the time. He never turned to He gave away free food all the time to thousands of people. So you say, I'm going to vote Democrat because the Bible says so. Or if you're a libertarian, you, you're sitting good if you're a libertarian because you're all about freedom. And everybody from every party quotes this sometime in an election speech when, when they say, you should know the truth and the truth will make you free. I am free. I'm liberated. I'm a libertarian. The Bible and my politics agree. In reality, it's not true. It's not even good to say, Jesus first, and then my political party second. That seems like a good thought. But do you know anybody who doesn't want Jesus on their side when they're running for office? I mean, there's a few people. But in this climate that we live in, all the candidates have shown up at a church sometime and talked, right? And you can say, oh, they're phonies. Okay, all right, I don't know. Do you know anyone that wouldn't say in our climate that we're in right now, who's running for major political office, who doesn't want God on their side, who doesn't evoke God something, who doesn't God bless America at some point? Listen, this side note. Jesus didn't show up to take sides. Jesus showed up to take over. And not politically. But through your soul. Through your belief that leads to action. Andy Stanley says, when we allow our faith to be subjugated to our political party, we lose our voice, we lose our distinction, and we lose our way as followers of Jesus. Our faith in the risen Savior Jesus Christ gets watered down, and, and look what happens. We lose our opportunity to be the thing that we've been assigned to, to be the conscience of our nation, which means the nation that we love suffers. When we give up, when we water down our faith for the sake of our political views, we're actually ripping off the country that we love so much. I'm not asking to agree with everything I say. I'm just asking you to consider it. The challenge is more than Jesus before politics, the Bible before politics. The solution is this. We must do something Jesus did. Not believe something. Belief's good. Not feel something, that's, that's all right, but do something. And the only way forward, I believe, and we can have a discussion if you want, the only way forward in this climate that we live in, because not one of you, not one of you sitting here in, or in Brewster or listening, wants our country to be more divisive. Not one of you does. You're not horrible, evil people. But the only way to move forward as a follower of Jesus is to put people first and politics second. People, their families, their feelings, their future are more important than your politics. You're like, oh, lighten up, Francis. Yeah, not, I'm just telling you. And more importantly, watch what Jesus says. 
This guy comes up and he's messing with Jesus and it happened all the time and he was a legal guy within the religious community. And he's like, hey, there's all these commandments. What do you think is the most important one? Or, or more importantly, what's most important? Let's, you could even kind of set it aside from a religious thing, but what's most important in life? And Jesus says, and he's got an answer, and some of you have heard this before. Some of you that aren't even followers of Jesus yet have heard it and don't know that this is where it came from. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And everybody running for office is like, yes, yes. Because that allows me a little wiggle room. Because all that is internal, right? Like, Hey, do you love God with all your soul? Well, I don't really know what that means, but yes. How about with your mind? Sure. But that's all in turn. You can't tell. I can just say it. But Jesus doesn't even take a breath when he answers this question. And he says, this is first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it or just as important. Or same as. They both go together. You can't separate the two. Love your neighbor as yourself. And for me, I wish you had stopped at love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Because he's saying, you got to love people who think and vote differently than you. The worst of those people. You're like, well, they're not my neighbor. They don't live in my cul-de-sac. Well, Jesus made it clear many different ways in his teaching and his stories that everybody's your neighbor, especially people who think and believe and act differently than you. Simply put, listen, if you just hear this line, you can go to sleep or check your fantasy football scores. We show our love for God by the way we treat people. And that doesn't get put aside during a political election year. That's true every single day. Come on. I know, I know this hits a little harsh. But you can't get away with talking badly about people or two people just because it's about politics. Just says a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All. Everything in the Old Testament. All the laws. All the prophets. Everything I'm saying now comes down to these two commandments. And the religious leaders are like, what about the 620 laws that we've accumulated over these last couple centuries? Jesus said, it's these two. You do these two and all the rest of the commandments fall into place. You love God the best you can with all your heart, just the best you can. And then you treat people, and you show your love for God by the way you treat people, you got it all covered. It's super, profoundly simple. It's so simple. They took 620, and they boiled it down into two. It's so profoundly simple. It showed up on a slide right there. Profoundly simple, but profoundly difficult. Because we get emotional when it comes to winning and losing in our opposition. All right? Go Cougs. I mean, like, you know, you Cougs don't hate the Huskies. But you say you do. Do you, you really hate? You, really, you do, don't you? Or go Huskies. And like all the Cougs are like, Ugh. although you've won this year, so it's like it's not as bad as it used to be. You know, anytime someone would bring up, since I'm such a big Boise State fan, who should be ranked in the top 10 uh, in just about an hour, you'll see in just a second. Um, and we have a leading Heisman candidate. I've been saying that. You guys don't listen to this thing I say. When, uh, Anyway, um, I used to, whenever you would bring up the University of Idaho, the vandals who murder and rape and, and hoard, they're vandals. They're, like, they're horrible people, vandals. Unlike a Boise State Broncos, just like, okay. Anytime someone would bring up the university, I'd say, oh, then I just would just lay into the, 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 the they don't even compete with us anymore. They're not, they're lower level. They used to be our arch rival. No, no, no. 
and then make fun of this. Have you been to the town of Alaska? Just make fun of it, blah, 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 blah. Until those four kids got murdered. Completely different. You'll never hear me say anything bad about the University of Idaho because they became a real people community to me. The problem is, when you argue or debate or feel, whether it's about something as insignificant as sports or something as super important as politics, your behavior makes sense to you. Like, yeah, Kyle, I don't know what you're saying because what I do and how I act and how I interact, whether it's social media or, or with people I come in contact with, yeah, I, it makes sense. I believe what I believe. I've always believed that. But everybody's behavior makes sense to them. The people who believe the opposite of you, their behavior makes sense to them too. So what do you do with that? Your political views make perfect sense to you. You think you've discovered the right way to live and vote and be in the United States of America. But everybody's political views make sense to them. Makes perfect sense. So what do you do with that? I'm just going to throw this out for free, and you can chew on it, and if you want to talk to me later about it. What if you're wrong? Listen, anytime you encounter somebody, here's a good response. When you encounter somebody and like, I can't believe you think that way. Or another response could be, what is wrong with you? Who hurt you? How could you even, how, as a person who loves God, how could you even consider that? Listen, when you encounter somebody and you don't understand why they believe what they believe, there is something you don't know. So maybe it's time to slow down and find out. I'm not saying you have to agree with them. I'm not saying you have to vote the same way they do. But in this climate, if as a father of Jesus, if you would stop and you would decide, I'm going to be a student and not a critic. I'm going to, be, I'm going to put my arrogance aside and my pride aside, and I'm going to say, hey, I don't understand. Help me understand. Instead of just launching into a tirade and uh, whatever side you're on, you have something ready for the other side, why they're wrong and why their candidate's bad. And you, you can just go off. But if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, even the neighbors that you don't like the most, you're going to have to slow down a little bit. Christ followers, if you're a follower of Jesus, they should be the most confident people in the world. Because Jesus is in charge and God is still almighty, still on the throne and still has a plan. No matter what. No matter what. Followers of Jesus should be the most curious. When you hear somebody else's story and understand why they are... It's tough to hate someone when you hear their story. They should be the most composed it's all right. God's bailed me out before. If this election doesn't go the way I think, God's bailed me out again. And for sure, they should be the most compassionate. Let me give you four winning questions. Sorry, they're not on your handout. They're really good. I would write them down if you care, or at least one. But I'm going to move quickly. When you encounter someone, and you should, Instead of avoiding people that believe differently than you or vote differently than you, here's some great questions. If you want to be a follower of Jesus that loves their neighbor as themselves, that you show your love for God by the way you treat other people, here's some great questions. Number one, what led you to hold that view? Like, why, why do you believe the way you do about that? And then listen. Have you always held that view? Like, was there a time where something changed? Like, listen, when I was younger, I was here. I knew everything 
about everything. Now that I'm 40-something, now that I'm 61, (laughs) man, I'm not over there anymore. And maybe I got soft or maybe I got wise. Number three, when it turns personal and you're talking about candidates, this is a tough one. If you were to say, have you met that person? Do you know that person? I love it that we want to make Donald Trump and Kamala Harris out to be these evil people. You hung out with them? Are they, do they have friends? Do you think they're good grandparents or good partners? Yeah. Do you know? Have you ever had a conversation with them? But you've put yourself in a position to judge them, person, their personality, their actions, as you think they come across to you? During COVID, you know Governor Inslee? No, well, now you cross the line, Kyle. That guy's <laughs> our <laughs> Lastly, this is a little snarky. So hold off on this one if there's too much tension. I get most of my information from the media. Where do you get yours? How do you get yours? <laughs> like, I do my research. I'm all over social media. Well, so does everybody that disagrees with me. And maybe, maybe I don't have all the facts and a clear picture of everything. If you do, you are, you are God. You understand it all. You, have, you know it all. Listen, as a follower of Jesus, especially during times of volatility, like an election, our posture, tone, and approach must reflect the same as Jesus. When the New Testament, when Paul, who's a follower of Jesus, gave his life to planting churches after being a persecutor of Christians, when Paul shows up in the New Testament, goes all over the place planting churches, and then writes letters back to these churches to check in on them and give them some encouragement, When Paul says, hey, do everything without grumbling or arguing, we're like, I mean, if you would ask me, yeah, that's for my kids. That's what I tell my kids when they they hit middle school. That's not applying to me. That's what parents say to their kids. Do you know that when Paul wrote that, that being a follower of Jesus was one of the most difficult things you could have been. You could be put to death. You could be imprisoned. Certainly made fun of. And Paul says, do everything. And like, he didn't mean everything. He said everything without grumbling or complaining. That principle doesn't go away just because there's an election coming up or just because you have a strong view on one side or the other. He keeps going. Because, so, that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. When you look differently than the rest of the world looks, then people pay attention and you have influence. Then you'll shine like stars. Like shine among them like stars in the sky. Then you'll make a difference. Then you'll have an influence. But if you look and act and talk like everybody else, you've lost your influence. Paul says, if you want to win, here's how I win. This is Paul, growing up where the government is constantly persecuting people of faith. Though I'm free, Paul says, and I belong to no one, no one controls me, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To win? Yeah! I want to win too. To the Jews, I become like a Jew. To win the Jews, like, wait a minute. To those under the law, Pharisees, everyone that, that, that's anti-Jesus, I become like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law, 
I relate to them on that level. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. And Christ's law is love other people like you love yourself. Paul says, maybe the leading church planner in the history of church planning, one of the leading voices in the New Testament says, I have become all things to all people so that by all means, all possible means, I might save some. Why? I do this for the sake of the gospel. People knowing that God loves them proved it by sending his perfect son as a sacrifice for our sin. And then Jesus proving he wasn't just a dude and raising, being raised from the dead three days later is why Paul shuts up and listen. Why Paul associates and mingles with people who aren't anything like him. So that they would understand the most necessary platform and principle, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Should you have an opinion? Yes, absolutely. If you ask my wife, she would tell you, I have an opinion on everything. Everything. Should you defend your point? Yeah. If it's appropriate and you can be kind about it, you can debate in a kind and loving way. Should you make a point at the expense of influence? Never. Ever. Listen. Your opinion doesn't even matter. It doesn't change anything. Your vote does. Did I mention that? You should vote. Everyone should vote. Except if you're too young because we don't trust you. We don't even trust you to dress yourselves in the morning, sixth grade boys, so we don't trust you to vote. Your opinion doesn't change the outcome of the election. Your vote does. So why would you give up influence? Why would you give up? Listen, if you look at the other side and you think, they are so horrible. I can't believe they believe in such an ungodly way. They are depraved. They are crooked. I can't believe it. Well, isn't that the mission field of someone who's a follower of Jesus? Jesus came to seek and save lost people. If the other side is so lost, wouldn't you walk towards them with the gospel instead of be their enemy because of a political system? That was pretty good right there, I'm just saying. I don't need to clap. No, I... I clap for myself all the time in my head. I I know. Listen, politics is important. The gospel is immeasurably more important. If you lose your influence because of your opinion or an issue, should you jeopardize a relationship over an issue, any issue? Never, ever, ever, never. So I got three next steps for you, if you haven't heard a few already. Let me give you three next steps. We we list them on the blue card. They're in your handout in Chelan and Brewster, and they're online. So please listen, even if you don't agree with me, and I'm sure we all don't agree. That's the beauty of real life. You don't have to. You don't have to think and act like me or anybody else. You're free and accepted and loved to be here as people of faith, as people of no faith. However you vote, no matter what. And we, we are going to be kind and loving towards each other no matter what. First step. Would you consider asking, leaning in, and listening? I don't know when it was, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years ago, and you've heard me say this before, I just started saying to myself, shut up. Stop talking. To myself. Just stop. Stop trying to win. Stop defending. Just shut up and listen. For some of you, you're really good at it. I have to work at it hard every day. But there's a time in the book of Job where 
everything. Job just loses everything. And all his friends are saying, curse God and die. And his wife is saying, what'd you do? Why'd you tick off God so bad? And, and Job's trying to figure it out. And then this verse right towards the end of the book where he says, I'm speechless in awe. Words fail me. I should never have opened my mouth. I've talked too much, way too much. I'm now ready to shut up and listen. Some of us need to get that as a tattoo. <laughs> me included. You really think I'm being a hypocrite? Now I'm with you. Two, put people first. Put people first. I know it's hard, but listen, we show our love for God by how we treat other people. It's important. If you're a father of Jesus, it's a command. You have no option to set aside kindness, love, patience, listening, understanding, letting no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, not gossiping. You have no option. Just because it's politics doesn't give you the right to break all those guidelines that God, that Jesus has set out for us. Just because you feel emotional and passionate about it doesn't give you the right. Ask a Jesus follower. If you're not a Jesus follower, you can stay and do whatever you want. And then there's some consequences for it, but okay. But as a Jesus follower, if you're going to love God with all your soul, heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself, you have no option. Kyle didn't say that. Jesus did. And finally, in your conversations, speak more about grace than about politics. I know that who our state senators and our governors and representatives, I know that's important. Who becomes our U.S. senators, who's the president, vice president, the cabinet, I know that's important. I'm talking really directly to you as followers of Jesus, if you are one. I'm betting that you talk more about those things and those people and those positions to people than you do about the saving grace of Jesus to people. It ain't worth it. Politics, who goes where, it's important. But people and where they go and how they live, so much more important. People who don't have a faith in Jesus, that are trying to get through the day with no hope and no safety net to get them through, they need to hear about the grace and love of Jesus. People who die with no hope of eternity, or those of us who lose loved ones with no hope that they have a faith in Jesus, isn't that so much more than who you're going to vote for or who you voted for? I would encourage you, please, consider. It's not a command that you talk more about grace, about Jesus, about God's acceptance of people through Jesus than you do about politics. Politics is important. Not more important than people knowing Jesus.